It's a, a great pleasure to um, have Cindy Brockway um, with us. Cindy is the Program Director for Cultural Resources at the Trustees of Reservations in Massachusetts, and we heard a little, little of the history of the organization this morning from Keith Morgan. In her role there, Lucinda, um, Cindy, is responsible for 111 properties on 25,000 acres. We think we have issues, <laughs> including such remarkable sites as Nomkeg in Stockbridge in Castle Hill and the Crane Estate in Ipswich, Massachusetts. In this capacity, she has an, been an integral part of the team leading the restoration at Castle Hill's Grand Allee and Nomkeg's Steel Choate Garden Restoration. An award-winning landscape designer and preservationist, Brockway has served a national clientele for 25 years before coming to the trustees. Through her firm, Past Designs in Kennebunk, Ma uh, Maine, her work includes such well-known projects as um, Fort Ticonderoga's um, Garden of the King, Jardin du Roy, Newport's Bellevue Avenue Estates, the Battle Green in Lexington, Massachusetts, the Villa Finale in San Antonio, Texas, and several other properties for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Her private residential designs won recognition throughout the country. She specialized in designing period-inspired landscapes featuring both historic and indigenous plants, and her work has been featured in Old House Journal, Victoria Magazine, Colonial Homes, 19th Century, and Accent Magazine, as well as numerous professional and trade publications. She serves on the Board of Governors of the Decorative Arts Trust and teaches landscape preservation as an instructor for the National Preservation Institute, offering courses on landscape preservation from Maine to Hawaii. Her work has been recognized by the Garden Club of America, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the Preservation League of New York, the State of New Jersey, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and she is the author of two wonderful books, A Favorite Place of Resort for Strangers and Gardens of the New Republic. And she is speaking this afternoon on a future for the past, harnessing the colonial revival in the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Cindy Brockway. Thank you so much for being here. I'm always a little bit embarrassed when I get introduced because I usually show up in my jeans and my old sweatshirt when we're working on some of these places. So um, it sounds very fancy, but basically the work that I do is just following a passion for care of a lot of these historic gardens and landscapes that all of you have been hearing about this morning and trying to move them forward. And there's lots of great people in this room that have the same passion and share that same commitment with me. So I always look forward to sharing all of their expertise and and their experiences too as we go forward. So my job today, rather than telling you a story about something that happened in the past, is to have us look at what happens to these incredible gardens and incredible landscapes once they've been around for 100 years, and how do we wrestle them back into some integrity, but also how do we give them meaning and value for people that just either think about them as beautiful places or value them for the important history that they really have to offer. So I want to take a walk with you and I want to have you look at a few projects and see what happens when things age and what we have to do to bring them back um, into to their vibrancy again. Um, I think in many cases when we talk about the history of the colonial revival and we look at historic photographs like this, we're so impressed with the grandeur of so many of these places because there was so much ability to create big houses and big landscapes as well as the little tiny cottages and the little landscapes that go with them. But just so that you know, the trustees owns this property, but this is what the house looks like today. <laughs> Those four columns that were on the front of the porch is all that's left after a fire took the house away in 1953. It was one of the most spectacular fires in the Housatonic River Valley. This is in Tiringham, Massachusetts. What this site does, though, is it is an incredibly beautiful ruin on top of a hill with one of the most beautiful vistas in the Berkshires. And as one of our board members, when they walked up to the top of the hill, which is really not a walk, it's a hike, um, said, this is so Bronte-esque. I just feel like this is the most beautiful place in the world. And it is true that over all these 30 years of doing work with these landscapes, there is something about the value of ruins in what we do. So understanding whether we should bring them all back to life or whether we should think about some of these places as romantic ruins, I think we can still touch people in both cases and maybe really sort out where we want to put our funding and our efforts and maintenance. Here's another garden example. Um, this is probably one of the most award-winning gardens from the Colonial Revival. This is Louise DuPont Crown and Shields Garden, which is now the Hagley Museum. 
And she built this Italianate colonial revival romantic ruin garden on top of her family's remains of their old powder works, the DuPont family powder works. And she won all kinds of awards for this. And it was as well known a garden as her brother's garden at Winter Tour or any of the gardens at Longwood. When I was there about 20 years ago, it looked like this. Again, still works as a romantic ruin, not so great for water quality, but it definitely has this appeal of being very romantic. And today, when you go to the Hagley Museum, I was there a month ago, they're still wrestling with what the role of this landscape should be in their story, because they are a museum that's based on industrial history and the history of making powder works and other um, of industrial efforts in the Brandywine River Valley. They've got an incredible industrial history library there, which they're very, very well known for. And then they've got this house and garden and an earlier French potager garden there that this sort of the fun, quirky little part part of their mission and they don't know what to do with it. So thinking about what the value is of the history and the stories that are here, whether it's the 18th or 19th century story or the early 20th century colonial revival and remaking of those ruins into a garden is really an interesting um, issue that they're now grappling with. We also now have been handed some of our best efforts at figuring out what to do with history. And there was a period of in, our, in our history as preservationists that we said it was better to interpret change over time. And so you get little house museums like this, where they've got an early house, they've rebuilt a 19th century barn that looked like the barn did in 1870, and then you've got a 1953 colonial revival garden, which now is historic in its own part that's added on to that. So these layers of history all coming together to create a space and a place that has its own story to tell, but what kind of value does that have for the future, and how do you start to really get people to understand the integrity of those individual pieces as well as the story that's told in the layover of everything, and the Shelburne Museum here is another really good example of all the change over time that you've had and how do you pull forward what the big idea is here for Shelburne and make it move forward and have it really have a lot of impact for people. There's other cases that I've seen that are not so pretty. And here's a case where the garden got saved. This is a Fletcher Steel Garden in Milton, Massachusetts. All of the other land was subdivided. The house was torn down, and it became a new housing development. So there was a one-acre historic garden in the middle of a brand new neighborhood. And I'm not so sure that this was preservation at its best. I don't know that the value of this garden, even though it's very interesting in the little elements that remain, is going to survive for a very, very long period of time with a lot of value to it. We'll see. And then we've got some spaces and places that have had this cycle of re rebirth and rejuvenation. Um, this is the Potager Garden at the Stevens Coolidge place that the trustees own. Um, Mrs. Coolidge was a descendant of Jefferson, and like every good colonial revival woman, you built a serpentine wall just like Jefferson had at Monticello, and then you put a French kitchen garden in front of it because this was a statement about your own family legacy and about your own value as a longtime resident of America. And and one of America's founding families. A very pretty space for us. When I came to the trustees, we had a series of 30 house, uh, th yeah, 13 house museums that we operated as traditional house museums that were valuable within their own communities, but we didn't think about them as statewide resources, and we didn't always link them together with a common philosophy or a common way of working or a common form of stewardship. And then when I came, because I was interested in landscape preservation, we broadened the scope of historic resources to not just be about historic house museums in their collections, but to include landscapes. And when we did that, we went through the whole collection of landscapes that the trustees owned at the time. And remember, the Trustees of Reservations is the organization that Charles Eliot founded that was saving historic, scenic, and cultural sites, uh, uh, natural sites, um, for the public enjoyment of the residents of Massachusetts. So the trustees has had a long time interest and commitment to history and to landscape legacy. But over the past 30 years, they really had become known much more as a conservation organization. So my job was to not only understand what we had for cultural resources, but also to try to explain to conservationists why these were important and why we cared about them and what they really meant. We have a new director who's very interested in the cultural side of our history, and that's been really been the genius behind this new spurt of energy that we've got for things that we're doing. So we went through and we used all of the UNESCO terms for landscape preservation. So that's why when you look up at the top and it says OE relic, 
it means an organically evolved relic of a landscape, which also is impossible for anybody to understand if they don't do in this business for a long time. But it essentially means a vernacular landscape that's had its own pace of change over time and is now disappearing back into the native plant cover that's that's um, indigenous to that place. So of all the properties the trustees own, we have a lot of house foundations buried back in the woods. And we have a lot of old road systems that have become trail systems that are the remains of earlier industrial sites or early agricultural sites that were part of those properties' histories. But if you look down this list and you see that what we really are managing is a lot of ruins, a lot of archaeology sites, a lot of properties that have structures to them um, without much landscape remain, a lot of landscapes that are continuing to evolve as vernacular landscapes with elements of their past in them but are still active farms or are still active um, forested uh, lands. And then we come down to this little bit of designed landscapes. And it was surprising to me as we looked at this whole collection how we think most often about the things that cost us the most money and take the most time for us to take care of. And yet really what we're responsible for are some of these larger numbers of things that we don't necessarily think about and think about what our resources really should go to. I also, over the years, have really looked hard at what this aging process is. You know, if you look at a photo image of somebody when they're born and they put together all of their photos as they grow older and you can watch them age, well, landscapes kind of do the same thing, but we rarely have a chance to take a picture every five years of a landscape and watch it decay. <laughs> and in many cases, that's what they are doing because there's so few that have that chance to have that revitalization happen to them. So I put together this little diagram that really talks about what happens. And I use the terms for public audiences of frosting, framework, and foundation. And the idea is that the frosting are the fun, beautiful, pretty flowers, the pieces that everybody notices that are very colorful, but they're the most ephemeral parts of the landscape. The framework are those parts of the landscape that survive for maybe two generations, sometimes three generations. They're fences, they're hedges, they're small ornamental trees. Um, there are the, the parts of the property that would be there for a couple of generations if we stopped intervening, but they will gradually decay and then disappear. And the foundation are those pieces that survive the longest. And with no surprise, the foundational pieces are things like building foundations, stone walls, um, roads, the gravel remains of old roads and walls, and those pieces that tend to be made out of stone or material that's so durable that even if the trees grow back up around it, you can still find them buried underneath some of that landscape. So here's an example for you to walk through. This is the frosting that I talk about. This is the flowers. This is the colorful pieces. Even the lawn is part of the frosting that we put on our landscapes over time. The framework are these pieces. So views and vistas, like down the walkway here on the left, that's an image from Castle Hill. Orchards, and sometimes orchard trees will survive and you'll see them bloom even when you're traveling down the side of the road in April. But for the most part, they as a landscape element can survive for a little period of time, especially if there's apples and pears in there because they tend to be longer lived um, trees. But they do end up eventually after 75 or 100 years folding in on themselves. And then hedges, fences, gateways, these are the kinds of things that will deteriorate and disappear over 75 years or so. Here's another good example. This is the Stevens Coolidge House. This is a house owned by the trustees in North Andover, Massachusetts. This orange stake that you see at the front of this bed, that's where the original edge of the bed was. And this has been a garden that's been maintained over a long period of time. It's a Louisa Bancroft Stevens garden, and Joseph Everett Chandler worked on the house. Well, over the years, as the, as the plants got bigger and the gardeners would edge the garden, the garden beds got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the big, wide grass paths that were on the side of it got smaller and smaller and smaller. So they've just redone all of the original dimensions to this garden, and big surprise, they've cut some of their labor almost in half because the beds are so much smaller, and they're, they're doing what they intended to be. The hedges that you see here on the side, if you look at the branching pattern on the end of that U up at the very top, you see where all the branches are starting to split off? Well, that's where the hedge had been maintained for a long period of time, and the cut marks were made, and then two branches came off from where those cut marks were. So you can see what the intended scale had been of that plant. And over the years, as gardeners didn't cut back as much as they did the year before, those plants get bigger and bigger. And in this case, they completely consumed the house. You couldn't even see the house behind the stone wall and the hedge. 
these are some of the foundation pieces. So foundation pieces tend to be topography. Um, roads and gravel paths will show up even in a drought in the middle of July, you can find them. Um, big open, uh, large trees, especially large overstory trees that tend to last about 125 years, maybe 150 if the weather's not so bad. And then all these different stone elements that we find in our landscapes now. So these are really that base layer that will still remain even if we don't interfere with the landscape over a long period of time. And here's a good example of a garden in Newburyport that was full of flower beds and rhododendrons and azaleas and it's now disappeared back into the woods and all that's left is the terracing and the stairs for this garden when it used to be. So if you look at a picture like this from some of these historic images and you start to think about that change over time and in your head start to play that movie about how this image will change and what will happen as 100 years go by or 50 years go by, you can start to begin to understand how we have to evaluate these landscapes and what they do. It also helps us when we start to rebuild them again to understand what is the most ephemeral and what is the most long lasting in the choices that we make. So typically what happens is that we have to interfere. We have to go in and we have to do maintenance and we have to be able to recorrect the cycle of decay in these landscapes in order for them to survive. So as the new design goes in, it will mature and then it begins to lose some of its integrity. And at that point, that's when you have to dig in there, replant plants, replant the hedges, rebuild the fences, redo those elements that, are st that you're starting to lose. And without that cycle of regular maintenance, then it will go back and it will start on that decay cycle again that I showed you before. So that part of the maintenance process is what we really end up talking a lot about and how much interference and how much of that rejuvenation happens always depends on three things. It depends on people, it depends on budget, and it depends on the value of the resource that you're looking at. So something that's very appealing and very attractive to a large body of audience will be more fundable. And something that has value and meaning to individuals that have had personal experiences there also tends to have a better opportunity for us to explain to them why we want to make some of these changes. So I'm going to take you through a couple of projects. Two are trustees projects and one is um, here at Fort Ticonderoga because I knew many of you may be more familiar with that garden project. I'm going to take you first to Ipswich. This is Castle Hill, um, 2,100 acres of property, um, 165 acres of designed landscape, and then another 2,000 acres of incredible marshes and wildlife refuge all around it. And the trustees Again, this balance between nature and culture is very, very important to us. And one of the things as we started to look at the landscape at this property was how are we going to make it sustainable because we are a conservation organization and we were very concerned about this interference in this cycle, especially of gardens that require a lot of time and ability and seemingly are not sustainable at all. And the conversation at the trustees was, well, if we can do something sustainable at Castle Hill and people can understand that you can take a giant place like this with its huge huge resources and its huge demands, then we can sell them sustainability on lots of other things that are much smaller and much, much more manageable. So we started to really look at that. And that meant we evaluated all of the elements of the landscape and looked at what had been there and what is there now. So one of the, the big elements in the landscape here is this garden that was designed by the Olmsted brothers. It was, they called it the formal garden. The trustees staff now calls it the Italian garden. And this is what it looks like now. So that framework piece is here, and the foundational pieces are here, but the frosting is gone. All of the plant material that's in there has disappeared. And it is still attractive. There is still a lot about this garden that is beautiful, and a lot of people come and enjoy these spaces. But there is definitely um, an, an interest in replanting some of those other elements. And whether we do them based on the historic planting pattern, or we do them with more sustainable, more durable plant material, like the peonies and the daylilies that are here at Shelburne um, is one of our questions we're talking about. The Rose Garden is another conversation that we had. So here's Arthur Shercliffe at work. He lived down the street from the Cranes. He became the landscape architect of choice after the first 15 years of the property's history. And he built this Rose Garden. These are all concrete columns 
and wooden, rustic wooden cedar posts. And then Harriet Rose Foote, who was this really noted rosarian on the North Shore of Massachusetts, selected all of the plant material that's in here. Well, if there is a piece of frosting that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it's probably the least sustainable, it's a rose garden. So our conversation here has been, well, what if we look at this as a ruin of what was here? What if we talk about the rose garden that used to be here, stabilize the paths, allow people to flow through this space, but experience it as the ruins of the former rose garden? And currently, that is, that is exactly where we're headed with this part of the landscape. Um, and whether that changes because some donor comes along, who knows? But right now, that's what we're talking about. One of the most iconic elements at Castle Hill was this L.A. Again, an Arthur Shorecliffe design. It was built between 1913 and 1915. Um, it was started as the mall from the house down to a casino area that they built that's sunken into the LA, you'll see in a minute. And then we had two other pieces added onto it. So it became what now the trustees call the Grand LA. And names drive me a little bit crazy because I like to be accurate with the historic names. So, but marketing has called this the Grand LA at Castle Hill and it sold a lot of weddings. So that's why we call it the Grand LA right now. But you can see um, see the statues sort of along underneath the feet of these Norway spruce. These are all Norway spruce. They were meant to be 80 foot tall trees. It turns out in the early 20th century, this was the hedging material of choice for most of these large estates. And Norway spruces will take a tremendous amount of shearing. I even noticed out in the Berkshires when I was out there that the grounds of Tanglewood are surrounded by Norway spruce hedging. And I'd never really paid attention to that before. The landscape at Castle Hill was modeled on some of the Italian Renaissance manors. And I think that the Cranes and their designers were heavily influenced by Charles Platt's book about the gardens of Italy and also Edith Wharton's book. So these are images from Edith Wharton's book about Italian villas and their gardens. And some of the elements, the combinations of stone and concrete in the pedestal bases here on these statues, this little scene here for the terrace treatment, the, cast, the terraces at Castle Hill look almost exactly like that. So it's very clear where they were getting some of their design inspiration for all of this. So we went back and looked at that design inspiration along with the historic photographs to try to understand what this resource was supposed to be and then how it's aged and how we put it back together again and plan for that. This is an image that was taken in 1923. I think that this is really where Arthur Shercliffe was headed. I think this is beginning to be the mature LA that he started to plant 10 years earlier. And you can see the big wide, 100 foot wide swath of grass. He did a lot of cutting. There's about 12 feet of earth that was removed from one side of this grass ribbon in order to make it level and have it flow over those three hills all in, um, in a single level plain. You see the casino area that's sunk there in the middle of the LA. And you can see here these Norway spruce hedges behind the statues, and then behind that, the very fluffy foliage of all those white pines. This is a terrible site to garden on. It's windy, it's driven by all kinds of extremes of weather and bad storms, and so truly the most durable of materials was what was used here. The other story behind all of this that we discovered as we started looking into all of this is that water was very scarce on the top of Castle Hill, and you're at the end of a very long road out towards the beach at the end of an estuary. So water, if you were going to have it at all, was going to be at the bottom of this Castle Hill and not at the top. So the cranes, being in the plumbing business that they were and making all of their money in plumbing and piping, created an amazing infrastructure underneath all of this landscape that you see here, including a giant concrete cistern that held 135,000 gallons of water. And if you can imagine, the underground structure is about the size of this building, this room and the room beyond us, um, all concrete, all still in perfect shape. So we replace the packing on two valves, and the, li the lines collect all the water off of the roof of the house, collect it all, put it into that cistern, and then it fed the water for all of the gardens here. So we reconstituted all of that, and it's part of the sustainability story of the restoration of this LA and it is still working and we're still using it for watering all the gardens now. This is what had happened. So you see how that view is closing in, that framework is getting lost. You can't see the statues anymore on each side of the LA and the Norway spruce have come up and now they totally hide the, um, the white pines. As storms had come along, these plants were planted four feet on center, if you can imagine. They really were meant to stay as hedges. 
as we had major storms and all of the, the canopy on these trees was all one-sided, they were falling like toothpicks down the middle of this whole alley. So there was a safety issue that was starting to really be alarming with, with everybody. Um, we, we looked at the research, we put together the plans, we made a, a proposal to be able to restore all of this, we put together our budget, including money to endow this feature so that we'd have money to take care of it over the long term, and a donor came forward and said, I want to be able to fund this project for you. So we did it in three pieces because we didn't have a lot of staff on site to take care of the trees once they went in. All the irrigation came from the underground cistern, and we did a campaign that replanted everything and put it all back together. And it is now a couple of years old on this first phase on the top of the hill here, and it is remarkable how quickly those spruces, once they got settled in, have really taken off, and we don't have to irrigate them anymore, so we can use the water for other things. Surprising to me, because when we started taking all these trees down, this is the kind of work that we were doing, and it was literally weeding by crane. Um, we, <laughs> we, um, we had to, I did a lot of photo edits to show people what to expect, because boy, when you start to take down trees, it's a very scary thing, and people get very alarmed. But it was very surprising to me how welcome everybody was to get this view back again. And it has become one of the best features now, again, of coming to Castle Hill. We've sold another third as many weddings, which isn't necessarily necessarily a great thing, but it certainly helps the bottom line for the budget. But we've also increased our visitation at this site by almost 30%. And a lot of it is because now this has become an element in the landscape that really is appealing to everybody and they come back to enjoy this view. We opened a small cafe at the house that sits at the top of this so you can enjoy your lunch and look out over the LA. And that has been remarkably helpful. So based on that success, we then went to look at the casino, which sits in this little hollowed out space here below that first run of of the of the LA and had been a beautiful element. It was a ballroom on one side and bachelor quarters on the other with a swimming pool in the middle, tucked behind a 12 foot tall stone wall on the back side, and really a place for play, for having fun and having a great time. When I saw the property in 1992, this is what it looked like. And if anybody wants to know about concrete technology and how concrete ages and how long it survives and how it starts to decay, Castle Hill knows everything and anything you'd ever want to know about concrete because the entire property was built out of concrete. So what you're seeing is some of this decay of the concrete elements in the stone walls, I mean in the retaining walls, and in the elements around the pool. The pool copings were all marble, and so we picked those all up and saved all of those and had to do a lot of work on the retaining wall because that was starting to collapse. So we spent a million dollars, we got the retaining wall fixed, we did not have the money to fix the swimming pool, so it was, it was mothballed. We basically created an archaeology site here, we buried it, we put tarps over everything, put sand over that, just like you would protect an archaeology site, and covered it with lawn, and have used it as an event space, knowing that all of those other features were under there. So finishing up the LA project and now turning to the casino, everybody said, yes, this is a really good thing. We need to put this back together again, too. So we unearthed all of those pieces that had been there. We saved all of the marble paving. We did not save the brickwork that was on the, the upper walkways. Um, the center here, where you see the marble paving all laid out, was pool, and I think we're going to keep that as lawn right now, although if I find another donor that would like to give us some money to make a water table out of that, I'd still like to put water back in that element. But you can see the topography here and the changes and the elements that we can bring back together again. More importantly, what we kept getting asked was, well, what are you going to do with it when you're done? It's a great casino. It's a beautiful space. Architecturally, it's wonderful. Landscape architecture is phenomenal. It's a great piece of our history, but we need to invigorate it. We need to bring programming here, and we need to make this work so that people interact with it and have a great time. Castle Hill has a huge camp program, so they are absolutely going to be using it this after the summer. They can't use it now. It's a construction site, but next summer they'll be back there again. And the buildings we've restored as multi-purpose spaces. We hired an acoustician and a theater designer and an architect to come in before we started this restoration and look at the acoustics here, because Castle Hill had also had a huge long run uh, uh, as a music and arts performing facility for many, many years when we had a partner running the 
the facility instead of the trustees. So people remember the arts and music programming that used to happen here. So we're, we put in infrastructure based on the design from those experts so that we can have um, music programming, we can run cabling, we've got the electrical that we need to be able to put bands up, and we can put up and down portable tenting if we need to get to that point. We don't have the money for that program yet, but we tried to at least include some of that in the infrastructure so that we could go forward. Because bringing it back to life means bringing people into it in as many ways as we can possibly think about. Now I want to take you out to Nam Keg, and I know when we have our panel discussion this afternoon, somebody was asking about farming. We've gotten pretty good at agriculture at the trustees, too, because it's another way of us being able to do both stewardship and provide fresh foods, especially for urban populations in Massachusetts. If you look at this aerial of Castle Hill, of Nam Keg in 1958, what you see here is a full-blown estate. Two generations of the Choate family, um, Fletcher Steele coming in and creating some phenomenal gardens with Mabel Choate, and a full farm operation that was down the hill. And right now, everybody parks their cars on these two vegetable terraces that you can see in the bottom right of the photograph. And we are talking about bringing back those elements. In this case, because we have the full house collection of furnishings and paintings and, and archives, we've got the full garden spaces, we've got the entire property, we have the whole package. And it is a National Historic Landmark, just like Castle Hill is. But this property, as people talk about it and the value of this property, it became very clear that the landscape architecture here truly had become a piece of fine art, which is what Fletcher Steele always liked to talk about in his garden design. And so the, artist in, the artistry and the patina and the detailing of this landscape became incredibly important in our planning. So as we began to look at these historic images, and then we looked at what had happened to them all, you can see how that patina was eroding. The hedges were growing up. We'd lost the view to the mountain beyond. When Steele and Mabel Choke created this, you see the slope in the lawn. He was mimicking the ridge line of the mountain that's up in the distance there and bringing it down into the landscape in the front. Well, by losing that view to the mountain and the, the slumping of these slopes in this south lawn, we were losing all of that detail that made this a great piece of landscape architecture. So um, we, we had a lot to, to do and we had a lot of decisions to make. So did we lose some of these things and allow it to wilder and just talk about the topography that was going to remain here? Or do we put back that framework and that frosting that we had lost here and bring it back to life? And again, we had the opportunity to work with a very generous person who said, no, this is a really great landscape. This is a great piece of landscape architecture. It, it needs and it deserves the um, investment that I can offer to you to help put it back together again. So here's the South Lawn again, replanted with some of its trees, the view restored. And then the biggest question, of course, was, well, what about the blue steps? This is the one piece that everybody seems to know better than anything about Nam Keg, and what are you going to do here? And we were losing birch trees right and left. The blue color that you see in those, um, those individual fountain areas underneath each one of the, um, the round areas here, Every time we repainted those arches, we picked, we matched the color that was there at the moment, but it was fading with the sun because the sun would come in and then lighten the blue. So every time we repainted, we were notching up the color of the blue higher and higher and higher, and it was getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So we did paint analysis. You'll also be surprised to find out that when they put this in, this is concrete block, and then they poured the concrete steps that sit on top um, and right behind those railings that you see. Well, of course, when they first put it in, the color of the concrete block was different than the color of the poured cement steps that they had. And so we have images of Mabel Choate and Fletcher Steele painting a blue stripe across the, the front level of the landings and then down the blue step. So if you can picture this 1930s very eccentric stripe design added to this, when we showed that as one of our mock-ups of the photo edit of what the painting combination could be here, people are going, well, I hope you're not going to put that back in. That would look terrible. And it turns out that, sure enough, we, we really looked at the history of that painting scheme. It was painted, and then I think they themselves decided it was just too over the top and too much, so they let it go and they they never repainted it, but they certainly painted the fountain areas themselves. So all the trees were taken away. Again, this was weeding by crane and then replanted by crane. Um, literally in a three-month period, we had to prove that we could make a big change and really know that we knew what we were talking about. So I have never done a landscape preservation project in such a marathon schedule as we had for all of this. But 
the the concrete was cleaned pieces were restored and repointed the railings were repainted a lot of birch trees were replanted again and the um all the elements that were in that original design were brought back including the original color of the fountains and now people say well that's not blue why do you call it the blue steps but it's this really rich dark bluish gray color that was a favorite of fletcher Steele's, and i see it in some of his other designs now when we start to look around so it is really what was meant to be there and in many ways it makes those look like really dark deep grottos, even though they're not very dark in the end. We also put back the cutting garden at the bottom here because that was the reason for the blue steps in the first place, was to get down to where the cutting garden was. And we have fully planted this garden space out this year. Next to it was an experimental garden. So this property was as much about horticultural innovation as it was about design innovation. And so we've, we're adding back that experimental aspect to the experimental garden and the cutting garden. So those will be changing elements and changing exhibits and places for us to test the hardiness of plants, just like um, they did for so many years here at Namkeg. Again, the other piece of this is what do we do? How do we bring it back to life? So an evening party to celebrate the first phase of the restoration was a memorable night for everybody. We're doing a lot of um, come and meet us on the terrace and watch the sun go down at Namkeg, have a cocktail, enjoy the view. Lots of little things at odd hours and different hours than the traditional house tour hours to really bring people back here for more than just a house tour or a landscape guide experience, but to really bring life to this property in many, many forms. This year, if you get a chance to come and visit us, you'll see phase two, which is the restoration of the afternoon garden. Um, in the end, this is a $2.6 million restoration that we're working on in five phases. And it should be a lot more, but we were doing a lot of the design and the guide, the management work in-house for this whole project. This had started to decay as well. You can see the gondola poles that this garden was so famous for with their missing tops and the color patina patina going. In our wisdom, we thought we were preserving these gondola poles, so we capped them every year with plastic and tied them off with bungee cords. And it turns out all we were doing was keeping all the moisture at the raw end of these wooden poles. So we were increasing the rotting uh, from the top down of these incredibly beautiful poles. We weren't sure how far we were going to go with this restoration. And we actually had talked a long time about keeping these poles in place, repainting them, and keeping the original. How much patina to keep and how much to really dig deep and redo things. But in the end, because of their condition, and when we found out that the carver that carved these poles originally in 1926 had trained um, an intern who is now in the business, he, he's um, the Bob Shore from Skylight Studios down in Woburn, he was trained as a wood carver under the carver that did these poles. So he, as the second generation of that carving studio, was able to say, yes, in fact, I can recarve those poles as beautifully as he did the first time because he trained me. So we decided to bite the bullet and go ahead and have the poles redone, but not after a lot of planning and a lot of conversation with a lot of people because this garden, like the Blue Steps, was a really important part. So here's one of those beautifully carved new poles, and you can see him working from the old poles onto the new design here. Um, really remarkable. So a week ago, these this was exciting, right? We were thrilled to see how what beautiful work this was all about. A week ago, they all went back in with all their original color scheme. Very dramatic and a little bit ugly, quite frankly, <laughs> but very bright. And yet, all of a sudden, the pergola and the roof down below there in the South Lawn and all the colors of the South Lawn start to make sense. The furniture here, we had restored a few years back, and it's very brightly colored. And it looked out of place against this aging landscape infrastructure that was all around it. So when we bring it back and we put it back on this patio, it is going to be a very colorful garden. And it was filled with bright orange and red fuchsias. So those will also go back this summer. So you can see that by actually going in and digging deep and having to pull back all all this color and all this patina, why this was such an over-the-top space for 1926 and why it was a space for play and for fun that everybody was talking about when they got it done. And I'm sure that we'll see what happens when we get it all put together and see if everybody likes it, but it's been fun to watch. The one thing we're missing are all of the maidens, you know, laying out in their chaise lounges in the afternoon garden that used to always be here in this garden um, as Mabel's family came and visited with all of them. But we are putting the seats back. We bring these chaise lounges out so people can sit and spend time in the garden at Namkeg and not just whiz through and get back in their car and leave again. So that people part becomes a very important part of what we're doing.
Finally, I just quickly want to take you over to the shores of Lake Champlain on the other side of the lake and have you take a look at this transformation and how the, the Fort Ticonderoga garden aged. And Cameron is here, who's now in charge of the garden. And I know Leonard Perry's here, who's been working on this property as well and sort of keeping it managed and bringing it, continuing to bring it on to the 21st century. So this will just be a little bit of fun for them. Um, obviously, the Pell House sits down on the shore of the lake at the foot of the fort. And right behind it was a really remarkable garden that had three different histories over its first 25 years of life. This was the first one. It was a garden plan that was really based on the French soldiers' gardens at the fort, and it was called Le Jardin du Roi because it was the restoration of the French soldiers' gardens here at the back of the house, completely inspired by the history of the site, completely iconic colonial revival restoration of the fort, along with all of this that the family had in their own backyard here down at the bottom of the hill. In the July heat, when we were doing fundraising teas in this garden, the grass all died, and all of the old paths bubbled their way back up, and you could see them in the grass around the later version of the garden. So this is what I mean about that foundation piece being there, no matter how long and how old the garden becomes. In the 19-teens, the center of the garden changed, and it became a water garden. And um, Harold Bossom, who was the architect that had restored the fort at the top of the hill, built a wall, an antiquated wall, and a tea house around this garden at the bottom to protect it a little bit from the wind off of the lake. It's, again, a nasty place to garden here. Um, and this became a water feature in the middle. And then in 1923, Marion Kruger Coffin came in and simplified that center panel and kept so the sort of early spirit that the garden had been born with, but renovated and simplified the planting scheme overall. And her plans called for cool colors to be up against the house at the top of this garden picture and hot colors at the other end. And the Garden Conservancy was involved in its early years in the plans for this garden and its restoration. And I remember Marco Polo Stefano saying, well, nobody would want to put that back together. That's a terrible combination of plants to have pink at one end and red at the other. That's just not going to work. But in the end, when you see the garden and you see it balance itself out, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, you can see that the hotter colors bring it into scale with the cooler colors in the front and it becomes a much more balanced view when you're sitting on the back porch of the house. This is what the garden looked like back when we started and the question was is this an exceptional American garden and my response was oh absolutely this is an exceptional American garden of course it is it's wonderful. So um, sometimes a little imagination can go a long way. This garden was a real lesson in what survives and this is the garden now and you can see how beautiful in that color palette that's there. Marion Kruger Coffin was working in a similar color palette palette to what Ellen Shipman was and some of the other women of their day. Um, very successful planting program um, and also the ability to change a little bit. So the bones of this garden, the structure of it, the, um, the look here to 1923 is what we chose to go with. We initially planted that original palette of material and to some extent that palette has changed a tiny bit over time, but it has that ability to be reversible and to be changeable and to really bring a new dimension for the gardeners into the garden too, which also keeps it alive. And I think this has been a really successful contribution to the experience now at Fort Ticonderoga. Every time I work on one of those big projects, however, in the back of my mind is this whole body of people that will come to see it. And what do they want to see and what do they want to take away as the little tidbit that they'll talk about at their cocktail party or over a cup of tea in the afternoon when they leave and they go back to their homes and their families and their friends. And the, I think about the numbers of people that have little backyard gardens and spaces and the choices that they've made and how their gardens mean a lot to them. So how can we make that connection between a, simply a great experience with your family and friends in the garden or into your own backyard? And often when I give talks about garden design, this is another small residential design that we just built 10 years ago in, in um, Boston. Um, it's really about that personal taste of the person and what their personal personality is that reflects itself into these gardens and landscapes. And there is a direct link. There's a lot to be learned by going to the garden at Fort Ticonderoga or looking at the hedges at Castle Hill or really looking at the fine-tuned details of what's going on at Namkeg that people can learn about their own gardens. And if I was a cultural geographer and if I was William Hoskins in, in England talking about the history of the countryside in England where he says, you know, that this is a three-dimensional textbook that we're really looking at and, and 
and learning from and talking about, if we can get people to break history out of the insides of a house and out of the fences that surround a lot of these historic house sites and really get them to think about the larger landscape and this three-dimensional textbook of history and change and decay and renewal, that's really where I think the heart of where we can really have an impact overall with so many of these sites and these resources. And so gardens like this that are built into an old barn foundation and then have a new life as a rose garden, or the French potager garden at, at the Stevens Coolidge House, all of them have this opportunity for life lessons or just simply for beauty and for personal experience that we can all really start to understand and explore. We have to become more diversified in the way that we talk about these spaces and places. It's not just about history, it's about a lot bigger conversation than that, and it's to a multi-ethnic audience that we really need to be able to drive some of our messaging and some of our programming that becomes very, very important. We also have to understand reversibility and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable for change in some of these spaces. These are some big outdoor art sculptures over at the John Hay Estate over in Newbury, New Hampshire. Again, they come in and then they leave, just like the birds do in the trees. These sculptures are here for a season and then they're gone again. So this marriage between art and artistry and the landscape and horticulture and design and art and nature and culture and nature are all these combinations that we can use to bring these places to life and make them work. This is the last slide. It's just a statement that really says that I do feel like these cultural landscapes, whether they're designed, whether they're in ruins, or whether they are um, uh, you know, in various states of decay and renewal, do hit home with this emotional part of this response that we have to any landscape that we go through. In all of our properties now at the trustees, we're talking about a statement of significance and a spirit of place. And we're trying to define in two sentences what that spirit is of that property and the passions and principles of those individuals that originally shaped it that can guide our programming and our thinking in how we look at this landscape preservation work. So we are talking about that emotional appeal. It's hard to grab onto and it's hard to wrestle into something that makes sense for everybody, but it is critical in being able to build out appropriate programming and experiences and drive a lot of our work that we're doing with landscape preservation there. So I hope, based on the talks this morning and then looking at this effort of decay and renewal and rebirth, um, that this afternoon when we have our panel discussion, we really can have a conversation gardener to gardener and preservationist to preservationist or designer to designer about what all of this means and what we're doing and how we're the stewards for two generations, three generations from now. What will they find that we've left them to inherit? Um, just like we look at the Shipman Gardens or the Beatrix Farron Gardens or Charles Platt's work or Arthur Shercliffe what's the next piece going to be. Thank you. the trustees of reservations mean? And when Charles Elliott set up this organization, he made the argument that pieces of land should be set aside for public enjoyment and under the care of trustees, just like you put books into a library or paintings into a museum, and those organizations have trustees that are running the library or the museum. So he set up this organization and envisioned it essentially to hold all these individual pieces of land for public enjoyment. And the trustees, and we still have a board of trustees um, that are responsible for their management and their care. We're a volunteer managed organization we have paid staff, but it is all um, a volunteer organization. And now we get confused with Indian reservations all over the country. So when I do travel and I talk for the National Preservation Institute, they go, well, which, you know, which reservations are you managing when it comes to or Wampanoag? Or, and I say, no, no, this is a totally different thing. And we've talked about changing our name, but like historic New England, you know, it's a little uncomfortable after 125 years to think about what that would be and how we make that transition and make it work. Okay, anybody else? Yes. <laughs> 
Great. I'm glad you asked that question because I look at these all the time and I forget that people don't know where I travel to all the time. Castle Hill is in Ipswich, Massachusetts, right on Argilla Road. It's at the very tip of Ipswich on the coast there. And Nam Keg is in Stockbridge. So just down the road on Route 7 from you here, much a little easier to get to. And we hope you all come. <laughs> Thank you again.